In this video, we'll talk about a very beautiful theorem from matrix algebra. It doesn't have any practical applications for engineers that I know of, but it certainly has a number of beautiful conceptual applications. And it's a very important theorem. And even if it weren't an important theorem and didn't have any applications, I would still talk about it because of its sheer beauty. So here's its statement. Any matrix satisfies its characteristic equation. So here's what it means. So here we have a three by three matrix and I calculated its characteristic polynomial. This might be minus the characteristic polynomial as we defined it, as the determinant of A minus lambda I. But that definition leads to a minus sign in front of the leading term for odd dimension matrices. So it might be more appealing not to have this minus sign. So another common way to define the characteristic polynomial is the determinant of minus that matrix. Take lambda I minus A, its determinant, call that the characteristic polynomial, and then you'll never have a minus sign here because all of the lambdas are positive. Well, because we're looking at a characteristic equation, we're equating it to zero, it doesn't matter at all because you can always multiply the equation by negative one. So in any case, let's call this the characteristic polynomial, and the statement of the theorem is that if we were to plug in this matrix into this polynomial for lambda, and I still have to explain what it means to plug in the matrix here, the result will be the zero matrix. In other words, a cubed plus 6a squared plus 11a plus 6a to the zeroth power, which is the identity matrix. Just like any non-zero number to the zeroth power is one, a matrix to the zeroth power is defined to be the identity matrix, and that will be consistent with a to the n and a to the minus one, and a times a to the minus one is a to the zero, which is identity. So all of the algebra works. So this would be identity, a to the zero identity. In fact, let me write out what we're evaluating. We'll be evaluating a cubed plus six a squared plus 11 a to the first power plus six a to the zeros power, which is the identity. And this will equal zero. I'm actually leaving a little bit of space because we'll need it when we try to justify why this is true. But the statement is that this matrix polynomial, so this matrix plus this matrix plus this matrix plus this matrix equals the zero matrix, three by three grid of all zeros. So this is kind of amazing if you think about it. So before we justify this, before we partially justify this, let's see on the computer that this in fact holds. And then we'll come back and try to justify this identity or this theorem as best we can. So here's the matrix A and here's its characteristic polynomial. So let's begin by evaluating the powers of A, which we will later combine into the appropriate matrix polynomial. So we'll start with A to the zero, which is of course the identity matrix. Next, let's evaluate A to the one, which is A itself, followed by A squared, which is this matrix, and finally A cubed, which is this matrix. So now we have all of the appropriate powers. So now let's combine them. We need to evaluate A cubed, it's right here, plus six A squared, plus 11 A, plus six, times a to the zero, which is the identity matrix. And the entire polynomial equals the zero matrix. So the theorem indeed holds for this matrix and its characteristic polynomial. All right, so how would we prove this theorem? We usually save proofs for separate videos, but in this case, we'll learn so much from the argument that we'll do it right here. But we won't do it for all matrices. We will do it for one special case of matrices. We will only do it for matrices that have a complete set of eigenvalues and eigenvectors. In other words, it will have as many eigenvalues and linearly independent eigenvectors as the dimension of the space. In particular, and this is very important, the eigenvectors will form a basis. So for now, 
we will exclude matrices with complex eigenvalues and complex eigenvectors, and we will exclude defective matrices, although we will go back to the computer and at least demonstrate with a couple of examples that this theorem still holds for those kinds of matrices. All right, so considering the special case of a full set of eigenvalues and eigenvectors, let's multiply this matrix. We don't yet know that it's zero, so we'll put a question mark here. We're not yet sure what it is, but let's multiply it by one of the eigenvectors, V. I could write down V1. Let's write down V1, the first of the eigenvectors. So what would be the result of applying a cube to it? Now this is a question we've considered several times before, and we know that the answer is lambda 1 cubed times V1. Well, they will all produce times V1, so I will factor V1 out. All right, what will the second one produce? Well, a squared times V1 is, as we've encountered several times already, lambda 1 squared V1. So plus, let's not forget the 6, lambda 1 squared V1. All right, what about a V1? Well, that's lambda 1 V1. So we have plus 11. Do you see what's happening here? Lambda, uh, sorry, lambda 1 V1. All right, and finally, I times V1 is, of course, V1. So this becomes plus 6 V1, take V1 out. So we're left with plus 6. And here we recovered the characteristic polynomial once again. And by the very definition, the eigenvalue is the root of this polynomial. Each of the eigenvalues is the root of these polynomials. The roots of these polynomial, the roots of this polynomial are the eigenvalues. So this expression right here is actually zero. All right. So there's the answer is zero times V1 which is indeed zero, so we can now erase the question mark. So we're not yet sure that this matrix is a zero, as we're hoping to show, but we at least know that when it multiplies V1, the result is zero, we show that much. What about when it multiplies V2, the second eigenvector? By the same argument, zero again. Third eigenvector, last eigenvector. For all of the eigenvectors, the result will be zero by the same argument. And if it's true for the eigenvectors, it's true for all the vectors in the space. Why? Just take any vector, represent it as a linear combination of the basis vectors. The eigenvectors form a basis. Why? Because we have a full set of eigenvectors. We have as many eigenvectors as the dimension of the space, so we have that many linearly independent vectors, so we indeed have a basis. So take any vector, decompose it with respect to that basis, plug it in, then this matrix will kill each individual term in that sum, because each term in that sum has one of the eigenvectors, times some coefficient. So the result will be zero. So this mystery matrix applied to any vector in the space is zero. And the only matrix that can possibly have that property is the zero matrix. So whatever we have in parentheses is necessarily the zero matrix. And the proof is complete for this. I don't want to call it a narrow space of matrices, a narrow set of matrices, but certainly a subspace of matrices. Now, according to, the, to this proof, you may actually begin to doubt whether this theorem is actually true for matrices that have complex eigenvalues or that are defective and don't have a full set of eigenvectors. So this argument would need to be adjusted, if it's at all possible. Well, the complete proof, the theorem still holds, the complete proof will be saved for later when, we're, when we do discuss complex eigenvalues and eigenvectors, and, we, and when we do dig a little bit deeper into the defective case, and then we'll prove this theorem completely. For now, let's be satisfied with this partial at very insightful proof, and see on the computer, by example, that this theorem still holds for matrices with complex eigenvalues and for defective matrices. Here is a defective matrix. 
Let's make sure that it's defective by evaluating its characteristic polynomial. So subtract lambda from the diagonal and evaluate the determinant. And it is lambda minus 2 squared. Indeed, 2 is the repeated eigenvalue. And you can see that subtracting 2 from the diagonal will not in any way produce a matrix with a two-dimensional null space. So there is indeed an eigenvector missing, and this matrix is defective. Its characteristic polynomial can also be written as lambda squared minus 4 lambda plus 4. So let's evaluate the powers of this matrix. We will need this matrix to the zeroth power, which is, of course, the identity, to the power 1, which is the matrix itself, and its square, which is this matrix. Combining the three, we have a squared minus 4a plus 4 times the identity matrix, and the result is the zero matrix. So the theorem works for defective matrices as well, even though we haven't presented a proof of this fact. Let's now talk about matrices with complex eigenvalues. All right, here's a matrix with no real eigenvalues we've encountered before. So let's make sure that it satisfies its characteristic polynomial. So to evaluate its characteristic polynomial, let's evaluate the determinant of this matrix with lambda subtracted from the diagonal. And the characteristic polynomial is this expression. All right, let's do what we did before, which is to evaluate the necessary powers of this matrix. Start with the zeroth power, which is, of course, the identity, then the first power, which is the matrix itself, and finally the square, which is this matrix. And now combining them, lambda squared, which is a squared, minus 7a plus 22 times the identity equals the zero matrix. So by example, we see that matrices without any real eigenvalues also satisfy their characteristic polynomial. So for matrices with a full set of real eigenvalues, we proved it. And for defective matrices, as well as matrices with no real eigenvalues, we're only able to see by example at this point.